Scene 8, writing. So uh, in this film we're going to talk about writing, alphabetic writing with English. We can define writing as a symbolic representation of language through the use of graphic signs. Unlike speech, it is a system that is not simply acquired, but has to be learned through sustained conscious effort. Not all languages have a written form, and even among people whose language has a well-established writing system, there are large numbers of individuals who cannot use the system. In terms of human development, writing is a relatively recent phenomenon. Pictograms and ideograms, when uh, if we talk about pictograms, when some of the pictures came to represent particular images in a consistent way, we can be we can begin to describe the product as a form of picture writing or pictograms. In this way, a uh, form such as might come to be used for the sun. An essential part of this use of a representative symbol is that everyone should use a familiar form to convey a roughly similar meaning. Note that as a symbol extends from sun to heat, it's moving from something visible to something conceptual. This type of symbol is then considered to be part of a system of idea writing or ideograms. The distinction between pictograms and ideograms is essentially a difference in the relationship between the symbol and the entity it represents. Logograms. An old example of logographic writing is a system used by the Sumerians in the southern part uh, of modern Iraq around 5,000 uh, years ago. Contemporary logograms in English are forms such as, like as I said, for example, a dollar or numbers or eight. A more elaborate writing system that is based to a certain extent on the use of logograms can be found in China. Many Chinese written symbols or characteristics are used to, as representations of the meaning of words or parts of words uh, and not of the sounds of spoken language. Rebus writing. One way of using existing symbols to represent the sounds of language is through a process known as a rebus writing. In this process, the symbol for one entity is taken over as a symbol for the sound of the spoken word, used to refer to the entity that symbols that comes to be used whenever that sound occurs in any words. Syllabic writing. In the last example, the symbol that is used for the pronunciation of parts of a word represents a unit that consists of a consonant sound and a vowel sound. This, is, this unit is one type of syllable. When a writing system employs a set of symbols, each one representing the pronunciation of a syllable, it is described as syllabic writing. There are no purely syllabic writing systems in use today, but modern Japanese can be written with a set of single symbols representing spoken syllables and is consequently often described as having a partially syllabic writing system or a syllabary. Alphabetic writing. If you have a set of symbols being used to represent syllables beginning with, for example, A, B sound, or M, M sound, then you are actually very close to a situation in which the symbols can be used to represent single sound types in a language. This is, an, in effect, the basis of alphabetic writing in principle, and alphabet is a set of written symbols, each one representing a single type of sound and phoneme. The situation just described in what seems to have occurred in the development of the writing system in of Semitic languages such as Arabic and Hebrew. Words written in these languages in everyday use largely consist of symbols for the consonant sounds in the word with the appropriate vowel sound being supplied by the reader. This type of writing system is sometimes called a consonantal alphabet. In fact, for some writers on the origin of the modern alphabet, it, in, it is the Greeks who should be given credit for taking the inherently syllabic system for the Phoenicians and creating a writing system in which a single symbol to single sound correspondence was fully realized. From the Greeks, this revised alphabet passed to the rest of Western Europe through the Romans and along the way underwent several modifications to fit the requirements of the spoken languages in country. As a result, we talk about Roman alphabet as a writing system used for English. 
Another line of development took the same basic Greek system, writing system, into Eastern Europe where Slavic languages were spoken. The modified my version called the Cyrillic alphabet and is the basis of the writing system used in Russia today. The actual form of a number of letters in modern European alphabets can be traced from their origins in Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics. Uh, written English. If indeed the origins of the alphabetic writing system were based on a correspondence between a single symbol or, and a single sound type, then one might reasonably ask why there is such a frequent mismatch between the forms of written English you know, and the sounds of spoken English. You know, you know, for example. Other languages, Italian, Spanish, have writing systems that hold much more closely to the one sound, one symbol principle of alphabetic writing. English orthography is not always so consistent. English orthography of contemporary language allows for a lot of variation in how speech sound is represented. The English writing system is alphabetic in a very loose sense. Some reasons for this irregular correspondence between sound and symbolic representation may be found in a number of historical influences of the, on the form of written English. The spelling of written English was largely fixed in the form that was used when printing was introduced in the 15th century England. Same line. The sound of languages, the sound of uh, patterns. So, the sound of languages. If we cannot use the letters of the alphabet in a consistent way to represent the sounds we make, how do we do go about describing the sounds of a language like English? One solution is to produce a separate la alphabet with symbols that represent sounds. Such a set of symbols does exist and is called the phonetic alphabet. In this, uh, in this uh, chapter, we will look at how the symbols are used to represent both the consonant and vowel sounds of English words and the physical aspect of the human vocal tract are involved in the production of those sounds. Phonetics. The general study of these characteristics of, of speech sounds is called phonetics. Our main interest will be an articulatory phonetics, which is a study of how speech sounds are made or articulated. Other areas of study are acoustic phonetics, which deals with the physical properties of speech as sound waves in the air, and auditory phonetics, which deals with the perception via the ear or speech sounds. Voiced and voiceless sounds. In articulatory phonetics, we investigate how speech sounds are produ produced using the fairly complex oral equipment we have we start with the air pushed out by the lungs up through the uh, trachea to the larynx. Inside the larynx are your vocal folds, which take two basic positions. When the vocal folds are spread apart, the air from the lungs passes between them unimpeded. Sounds produced in this way are described as voiceless. When the vocal folds are drawn together, the air from the lungs repeatedly pushes them apart as it is passed through, creating a vibration effect. effect. Sounds produced in this way are described as voice. Place of articulation. Once the air has passed through the larynx, it comes up and out through the mouth and or the nose. Most consonant sounds are produced by using the tongue and other parts of the mouth to constrict in some ways the shape of the oral cavities through which the air is passing. The terms used uh, to describe many so sounds are those which denote the place of artic articulation of the sound, that is, the location inside the mouth at which the constriction take place, takes place. Manner of uh, articulation. So far, we have concentrated on describing consonant sounds in terms of where they are articulated. We can also describe the same sounds in terms of how they are articulated. Such a description is necessary if we want to, to be able to differentiate between some sounds which in the preceding discussion we have placed in the same category. Vowels. While the consonant sounds are mostly articulated via closure or obstruction in the vocal tract, vowel sounds are produced with a relatively 
free flow of air, they are typically voiced. To describe vowel sounds, we consider the way in which the tongue influences the shape through which the air flow must pass. The sound patterns of language. Phonology is essentially the description of the system and patterns of which sounds in a language. It is, uh, in effect, based on a series of what every speaker of language unconsciously knows about the sound patterns of that language. Because of the theoretical status, phonology is concerned with the abstract or mental aspects of the sounds in language rather than with the actual physical articulation or speech sound. Phonology is about the underlying design, the blueprint of each sound, which serves as a constant basis of all the variation in different physical articulations of that sound type in different contexts. Phonemes, uh, each one of these meaning distinguishing sounds in a language is described as phonemes. When we, uh, as phonemes, yeah. When we learn to use alphabetic writing, we are actually using the concept of the phoneme as a single stable sound that we sound type which is represented by a single written symbol. If we substitute one sound for another in a word and there is a change of meaning, then the two sounds represent different phonemes. Phonemes and allophones, while the phoneme is the abstract unit or sound type, there are many different versions of sound a type regularly produced in actual speech in the mouse. We can uh, describe those different versions as phones. Phones are phonetic units and appear in square brackets. When we have a set of phones, all of which are versions of one phoneme, we add the prefix allo, one of the common related set, and refer to them as allophones of that phoneme. For example, the T sound is a word tar is normally pronounced with a strong poof of as and is represented in the t sound word star if you put uh, your hand in front of your mouse you say then you should be able to feel some physical evidence of aspiration accompanying t sound at the beginning of tar but not in star so normal speech these two processes of assimilation and deletion occur in everyone's normal speech and should not be regarded as some type of sloppiness or laziness in speaking in fact consistently avoiding the regular patterns of assimilation and deletion used in a language would result in extremely artificial sounding talk the point of investigating this phonological process is not to arrive at a set of rules about how a language should be pronounced but to try to come to an understanding of the regularities and patterns which underlie the actual use of sounds in language. Uh, in this uh, theme, we are going to talk about word formation, types of word formation. Study of the origin and history of a word is known as its etymology, a term which, like many of our technical words, comes to us through Latin but has origins in Greek. Uh, time on original form, logia means study of, and it is not to be confused with et etnomology, also from Greek. Uh, when we look closer at the et etymologies of less technical words, we soon discover that there are many different ways in which new words can enter the language. Coinage. One of the least common processes of word formation in English is coinage, that is, the invention of totally new terms. The most typical sound sources are invented trade names for commercial products that become general terms, usually without capital letters for any version of that product. Borrowing. As Bill Bryson observed in the quotation that presented earlier, one of the most common sources of new words in English is the process simply labeled borrowing. That is the taking of, of words from other languages. Technically, it's more than just borrowing because English doesn't give them back. Compounding. In some of the examples we have just considered, there is a joining of two separate words to produce a single form. Those a land and word are combined to produce land word in German. This combining process, technically known as compounding, is very common in languages like German and English, but much less common in languages such as French and Spanish. Blending. The combination of two separate forms to produce a single new term is also present in the process called blending. However, blending is typically accomplished by taking only the beginning of one word and joining it to the 
and of the other world. In some parts of the USA, for example, there is uh, a product that is used like gasoline, but it's made from alcohol. Uh, so the blended word from, for referring to this product is gasohol. Clipping. The element of reduction that is noticeable in blending is even more apparent in the process described as clipping. This occurs when a word or more than one syllable is reduced to a shorter form, uh, uh, usually beginning in casual speech. Back formation, a very specialized type of reduction process is known as back formation. Typically, a word of one type, usually a noun, is reduced to form a word of another type, usually a verb. A good example of back formation is a process whereby the noun, a television, uh, first time into use and then uh, the verbs themselves uh, televised was created from it. Conversion, a change in the function of, function of a word as for example when a noun comes to be used as a verb without any reduction is generally known as conversion. Other labels for this very common process are category change and factional shift. Acronyms, acronyms are, the, are new words formed from the initial letters of a set of other words. This can be formed such as CD, compact disc, VCR, video cassette recorder, where the pronunciation consists of saying each separate letters. More typically, acronyms are pronounced as new single words, as in NASA, N-A-C-A. Derivation, in our list so far we have not dealt with what is so by far the most common word formation process to be found in the production of new English words. This process is called derivation and it is accomplished by means of a large number of small bits of the English language which are not usually given separate listings in dictionaries. These small bits are generally described as affixes affixes and prefixes. Looking more closely at the preceding group of words, we can see that some affixes have to be, to be added to the beginning of the word. Um, means, for example, these are called prefixes. Other affixes have to be added to the end of the word, less, each, for example, and are called suffixes. All English words formed by this derivation process have either prefixes or suffixes or both. This mislead how the prefix is respectful has both a prefix and suffix, and foolishness has two suffixes and infix. Infixes, there is a third type of affix but formally used in English but found in some other languages. This is called an infix, and as the term suggests, it is an infix that is incorporated inside another word. So in many languages, what appear to be single forms actually turns out to contain a large number of word-like elements. For example, in Swahili, spoken throughout East Africa, the form mita kupenda can be what in English would have to be represented as something like I will love you. Now in the, in the Swahili form is a single word. If it is a word, then it seems to consist of a number of elements which in English turns out as separate words. We do not actually have to go to other languages such as Swahili to, to discover what word forms may consist of a number of elements. We can recognize that English word forms such as talks, talker, talked, and talking must consist of one element talk and a number of other elements such as s, er, uh, er, ed, and I and G. All these elements are described as morphemes. The definition of a morpheme is a minimal unit of a meaning or grammatical function units of grammatical function include forms used to indicate past tense or plural, for example, uh, like a play, play, place, free and bound morphemes. From these examples we can make a broad distinction between two types of morphemes. There are free morphemes, that is, morphemes that can stand by themselves as single words, for example, open and true. There are also bound morphemes, which are those forms that cannot form a stand alone and are typically attached to another form, exemplified as re, re, ist, ed, s. So we can say that all suffixes, prefixes, and suffixes in English are bounded morphemes. The three morphemes can generally be identified as a set of separate English word forms such as basic nouns, adjectives, verbs, etc. When they are used with uh, bound morphemes attached to basic word forms are technically known as stems. 
Lexical and functional morphemes. What we have described as three morphemes fall into two categories. The first category is that set of ordinary nouns, adjectives and verbs that we think of as the words that carry the content of the messages we can be, uh, we can add new lexical morphemes to the language rather than easily so they are treated as an open class of words. Other types of free morphemes are called functional morphemes. Examples are and but when, because, on, near, above, in, the, that, it, with them. Morphological description, the difference between uh, derivational and inflectional morphemes is worse in society. An inflectional morpheme never changes the grammatical category of a word. However, der a derivational morpheme can change the grammatical category of a word. Morphs and allomorphs. One, day, one way to treat differences in inflectional morphemes is by proposing variations in morphological realization rules. In order to do this, we draw an analogy with some processes already noted in phonology. Just as we treated forms as the actual phonetic realization of forms, we can propose morphs as the form, actual forms used to realize morphemes. For example, the form cats consists of two morphs, cat plus S. The Latin a lexical morpheme and an inflectional morpheme, plural, the form buses also consist of two morphs, bus plus es, realizing a lexical morpheme and an inflectional morpheme, plural. So there are at least two different morphs, s and es, actually s is used to realize that inflectional morpheme, plural. Just as we noted that there were allophones of a particular phoneme, so we can recognize the existence of allomorphs of a particular morpheme. That is when we find a group of different morphs, all versions of the one morpheme, we can use the prefix all, one of the closely related set, and describes them as allomorphs of that morpheme. Take the morpheme plural. Note that it can be attached to a number of lexical morphemes to produce structures like cat plus plural, bus plus plural. It, it, in each of these examples, the actual forms of the morphs, morphs that result from the morpheme plural are different, yet they are all, all morphs of the one morpheme. When we look at man plus plural, we have a vowel change in the man, so it will, it will be man as the morphs that produces the irregular plural form man. Thank you. Sin 12. Grammar, synthetic and analytical structure of the language. So we are going to cover these two main areas of language. The process of describing the structure of phrases and sentences in such a way that we account for all the grammatical sequences in a language and rule out all the ungrammatical sequences is one way of defining grammar. It is a kind of definition assumed when we talk about the grammar of English as opposed to the grammar of Swahili, for example, Tagalog or Turkish. Each of these languages has different ways of forming grammatical phrases and sentences. Studying grammar in this way has a very long tradition. Traditional grammar, the term article, the terms article, adjective and noun that we use to label the grammatical categories of the words in the phrase, the lucky boys come from traditional grammar which has its origins in the description of languages such as Latin and Greek. Since there were well established grammatical descriptions of these languages, it seemed appropriate to adapt the existing categories from these descriptions and apply them in the analysis of newer languages such as English. After all, Latin and Greek were the languages of scholarship, religion, philosophy and knowledge. So the grammar of these languages has taken to be the model for other languages. The best known term from that tradition others used in describing the parts of speech. So the parts of speech, uh, terms such as adjective and noun are used to label forms in the language as a part of speech or word class. Noun are words used to refer to people, words, objects, creatures, places, qualities, phenomena, abs and abstract ideas as, they, as if they were all things. Articles are words used with nouns to form noun phrases classifying those things uh, or identifying them as already known. Adjectives are words used typically with nouns to provide more information about the things referred to. 
verbs, for example, happy people are talked to for strange experience. Verbs are used are words used to refer to various kinds of actions is and states involving people and things and events. Next, adverbs are words used typically with words to provide more information about the action, states and events. Some adverbs, for example, like really, very, are also used with adjectives to modify information about things. Uh, for example, really large objects move slowly. I had a very strange experience yesterday. Next, preposition are words. Prepositions are words used with nouns in phrases, providing information about time, place, and other connections involving actions and things. Pronouns are words used in place of nouns phrases, typically referring to people and things already known. Conjunctions are words used to make uh, connections and indicate relationships between events. Um, for example, Chantal's husband was so sweet and helped her a lot because she couldn't do much when we was she was pregnant. Uh, so, grammatical gender, the type of biological distinction used in English is quite different from the more common distinction found in language studies use grammatical gender. Whereas natural gender is based on sex, male and female, grammatical gender is based on the type of noun masculine and feminine. Synthetic and analytic languages. According to the morphological classification, all languages of the world are divided into groups. Um, now uh, we are interested in one of them the groups of inflectional languages. The second name is Fusion languages. Inflection is an ending, as we already have uh, discussed. It means that an, the ending expresses a grammatical meaning, such as gender, number, person, tense, case, etc. From the 19th century, all inflectional languages were divided into B groups, synthetic and analytic languages. For example, Ukrainian, Russian, German, Polish, Czech, Belarusian languages belong to the first group, whereas English, French, Bulgarian, Danish, and Indian languages belong to the second one. The synthetic languages are the languages where the grammatical meaning expresses with the help of the endings, affixes, alternations, sublation. Uh, in some Slavic languages, for example, there is an imperfective and perfective form of words. The word only is important for the analytic languages, whereas for the syntactical, it is not important. In Ukrainian, we can say uh, the phrases which means literally to go, we go, go. In English, it sounds strange, we go home is much better. In English or French, for example, we should keep the word order noun, verb, object. While for Ukraini Ukrainian, for example, it is not obligatory. The ending in the inflectional languages can express a lot. For example, kota, a masculine singular genitive case. So that's all about the signal term. Thank you. Sim syntax. So here we will talk about syntax and there is three diagram. Syntax, the arrangement of words in sentences, clauses and phrases and the study of the formation of sentences and the relationship of their component parts. In a, large such as, in a language such as English, the main device to show the relationship among words is word order. For example, the girl loves the boy. The subject is, uh, is in initial position and the object follows the word. Tran transposing them changes the meaning. In many other languages, case markers indicate the grammatical relationship. The study of syntax also includes the investigation of the relationship between, among sentences that is similar such as John saw Mary and Mary was seen by John. Syntax received much attention after 1957 when the American linguist Noam Chomsky proposed a radical new theory uh, of language transformational grammar. When we set out to provide an analysis of the syntax of a language, we try to adhere to the all and only criteria. This means that our analysis must account for all the grammatically correct phrases and sentences and only those grammatically correct phrases and sentences in whatever language we are analyzing. 
In other words, if we write rules for the creation of well-formed structures, we have to check that those rules, when applied logically, won't also lead to ill-formed structures. Deep and surface structure, two superficially different sentences are shown in these examples. Charlie broke the window. The window was broken by Charlie, for example. In traditional grammar, the first is called an active sentence, focusing on what Charlie did, and the second is a passive sentence, focusing on the window and what happened to it. The distinction between semis is difference in their surface structure, uh, that is, the different syntactic forms they have as individual English sentences. However, this superficial difference in form disguises the fact that the two sentences are very closely related, even identical at some less superficial level. The other underlying level where the basic components, noun, phrase, verb, noun, phrase, shared by the two sentences can be represented, is called the deep structure. The deep structure is an abstract level of structural organization in which all elements determining structural interpretation are represented. That same deep structure can be the source of many other surface structures, such as it was Charlie who broke the window, and was it the window broken by Charlie, in short? The grammar must be capable of showing how a single underlying abstract representation can become different surface structures. Talking about three diagrams, we can say that one of the most common ways to create a visual representation of syntactic structure is through tree diagrams. We can use the symbols introduced uh, art, article, and noun, and p noun phrase to label parts of the tree as we try to capture the hierarchy and organization of those parts in the underlying structure of phrases and sentences. So we can take the information in a labeled or bracketed format shown on the left and present it in a two tree diagram shown on the right. Symbols used in syntactic analysis, we have already encountered some on symbols that are used as abbreviation for syntactic categories, examples S sentence, and P noun phrase, and noun art article, and so on. Other such a PP, for example, prepositional phrase, seem fairly transparent. There are three more symbols that are commonly used in syntactic. Same for T, semantics and uh, pragmatics. So accordingly, we are going to touch upon two things in this uh, chapter. Semantics is a study of the meanings of words, phrases and sentences. In semantic analysis, there is always an attempt to focus on what the words conventionally mean rather than on what an individual speaker might want them to mean or on a particular occasion. This approach is concerned with objective or general meaning and avoids trying to account for subjective or local meaning. Doing semantics is attempting to spell out what it is well, we all know when we behave as we share knowledge of the meaning of a word and phrase or sentence in language. Meaning. While semantics is a study of meaning in language, there is more interest in certain aspects of meaning than in others. We have already ruled uh, out special meanings that uh, one individual might attach to words. We can go further and make a broad distinction between the conceptual meaning and the associated meaning. Conceptual meaning covers the basic essential components of meaning that are conveyed by the literal use of a word. It is the type of meaning that these dictionaries are designed to describe. Some of the basic components of a word like needle in English might include thin, sharp, steel, instrument. These components would be part of the conceptual meaning of needle. However, different people might have different associations and, or connotations attached to a word like needle. They might associate it with pain or illness or blood or drugs, red or needing or hard to find, especially in a haystack. And that association may, may differ from one person to the next. These types of associations are not threatened, treated as part of the words conceptual meaning. Semantic features. One way in which the study of basic conceptual meaning might be helpful would be as a means of accounting for the oddness we experience when we read sentences such as the following. The hamburger at the board. The table listened to the radio. The horse is reading the newspaper. We should first note that the oddness of the sentences does not derive from their syntactic structure. 
According to the basic syntactic rules for forming English sentences, we have well-formed structures. However, the meaning of them, of the words used, is not accurate. This sentence is syntactically good, but semantically odd. This, uh, since the sentence the boy at the hamburger is perfectly accept, uh, acceptable, we may be able to identify the source of the problem. Lexical relations. Not only, not only can words be treated as containers of meaning or as fulfilling roles in events, they can also have relationships with each other. In every day talk, we often explain the meanings of words in terms of their relationships. If we are asked where the meaning of the word conceal, for example, we might simply say it's the same as height or give the meaning of shallow as the opposite of deep uh, or the meaning of daffodil as a kind of flower. In doing so, we are characterizing the meaning of each word not in terms of its component features but in terms of its relationship to other words. This approach is used in the semantic description of language and treated as the analysis of lexical relationships. The lexical relations uh, we have just exemplified are synonymy, antonymy, hyponymy. So synonymy. Two or more words with very closely related meanings are called synonyms. They can often, they not always, be substituted with each other in sentences. Other common examples of synonyms are there, for example, uh, almost nearly, big, large, broad, wild, and so on. Antonymy. Two forms with opposite meanings are called antonyms. Some common examples are the pairs alive, dead, big, small, fast, slow, happy, sad, uh, male, female, and so on. Hyponymy. When uh, the meaning of one form is included in the meaning of another, the relationship is described as hyponymy. Examples are the pairs like animal, dog, dog, pudding, vegetable, carrot, flower, rose, uh, and, and so on. Prototypes. While the words canary, cormorant, dove, star, flamingo, uh, Robin are all equally co hyponyms of the superordinate bird. They are not all considered to be equally good examples of the category bird. According to some researchers, the most characteristic instance of the category bird is Robin. The idea of the charismatic characteristic sorry, instance for, of a category is known as the prototype. Homophones and Hama names, when two or more different Forms have the same pronunciation they have described as homophones. Common examples are bear, bear, meat, meat, written uh, in the sim same way, but uh, pronunciation is in the same way, but uh, written in a different way. So, uh, this word has two or more unrelated meanings, as is this examples. For example, also bank, bank, bank of a river, financial institution. Pupil at school, pupil in the eye. Polysemy. When we encounter two or more words with the same form and the related meanings, we have what is technically known as polysemy. Polysemy can be defined as one form having multiple meanings that are all related by extension. Examples are the word head used to refer to the object of to on top of your body. Fraud on top of a glass of beer, person at the top of a company or department, and many other things. Metonymy, using the words to refer to the other, is an example of metonymy. It is our familiarity with metonymy that makes it possible for us to understand, for example, he drank the cool bottle, although it sounds absurd, literally. He drank the liquid, not the glass object. We also accept. The White House has announced it or Downing Street protested without being puzzled that building appeared to be talking. We use metonymy when we talk about filling up the car, answering the door, boiling a kettle, giving someone a hand or needing some wheels. Pragmatics. In many ways, pragmatics is a study of, of invisible meaning of 
or how we recognize what is meant even when it is not actually said or written. In order for that to happen, speakers or writers must be able to depend on a lot of, of shape, shared assumptions and expectations when they try to communicate. The investigation of those assumptions and the expectations provided us with some insights into how more is always being communicated than is said. Speech acts. We have been considering ways in which we interpret the meaning of the utterance in terms of what was the speaker intended to convey. We have not yet considered the fact that we usually know how to speak, how the speaker intends us to take what is said in very general terms. We can usually recognize the type of action performed by a speaker with the utterance. We use the term speech act as mm, described actions such as requesting, commanding, questioning, or informing. Uh, so, and the last one is politeness, where we can think of politeness in general terms as having to do with idea like being tactful, modest, and nicer to other people. In the study of linguistics, politeness, the most relevant concept is face. Your face is pragmatic, is your public self-image. So that's all. Thank you. Scene 15. Language acquisition. And uh, in this scene, we are going to uh, cover definitions and distinctions, conditions, acquisition, the logical problem of acquisition, how is language transmitted, stages of uh, language acquisition. So, language acquisition is a process which can take place at any period of one's life. In the sense of first language acquisition, however, it refers to the acquisition unconscious learning if one's native language or languages in the case of bilinguals during the first six or seven years of one's life roughly from birth to the time one starts school. Characteristics of first language acquisition uh, first it is an instinct. This is true in the technical sense uh, for example it is triggered by birth and takes its own course to of course linguistic input from the environment is needed for the child to acquire a specific language. As an instinct, language acquisition can be compared to the acquisition of binocular vision or binaural hearing. Second, it is very rapid. The amount of time uh, required to acquire one's native language is quite short, very short compared to that needed to learn a second language successfully later on in life. Thirdly, it is very complete. The quality of first language acquisition is far better than that of a second language learned later on in life. One does not forget one's native language, so one might have slight difficulties remembering words if you do not use it for a long time. The fourth, it doesn't require instruction, despite the fact that many non-linguistic things that mothers are important for children to learn their native language, instructions by parents or caretakers are necessary despite the psychological benefits of attention to the child. What is the watershed separate in first and second language acquisition? Generally, the ability to acquire a language with native speaker competence diminishes severely around puberty. There are two suggestions as to why this is the case. First, shortly before puberty, the lateralization of the brain takes place and this may lead to, lead to general inflexibility. Second, with puberty, various hormonal changes take place in the body. This may also lead to an inflexibility, which means that language acquisition cannot proceed to the conclusion it reaches in early childhood. Definitions and distinctions. So first, uh, let's uh, discuss first language acquisition. This is the acquisition of the mother tongue. Chronology is important here. See, uh, the degree of competence acquired may vary from individual to individual and may be checked by later switching to another language. Note that language acquisition is largely independent of intelligence. Although individuals can and do differ in their master of, of open classes such as vocabulary. By and multilingualism, this is the acquisition of two or more languages from birth or at least uh, together in early childhood. The ideal situation where all languages are equally represented in the child's surroundings and where the child has an impartial relationship to which is hardly to be found in reality, so that of two or more languages, one is bound to be dominant. 
second language acquisition. This is the acquisition of a second language after the mother tongue has been acquired. Usually it refers to acquisition which begins after puberty. For example, typically adult language acquisition, sometimes a place by the term first language acquisition. Error. This is an incorrect feature of lang in language acquisition which occurs because of the stage at which the child is at a given time. Errors are regular and easily explained. For instance, the use of weak verb uh, forms of strong ones or the uh, over application of the S plural to all nouns in English would be examples of errors. Such features tend to write themselves the time uh, with the time when the child appreciates and that many word classes contain a degree of irregularity. He state here one is dealing with a random, non-systematic and usually unpredictable phenomenon in second language in learning. Mistakes are sometimes termed performance errors to emphasize that they arise on the spur of the moment when speaking and are not indicative of any acquisitional stage. Competence. It is the abstract ability to speak a language. For example, knowledge of a language independent of its use. Performance is actual use of language. Its features do not necessarily reflect characteristics of performance. For example, when one is nervous, tired, drunk, one may have difficulty speaking coherently. This, however, does not mean that one cannot speak in one's native language. Conditions of acquisition. There are three conditions of acquisition. Natural, controlled, guided language acquisition. Note that a child is not corrected as often by his or, her, uh, his or her mother as one might imagine. self connection correction is most common but mm, not immediate due to factors. Most broadly speaking because of a lack of communication and secondly by consistently hearing correct usage of the part of the mother, the child ev eventually drops his her incorrect forms while uh, Perhaps communic communicatively uh, effective or grammatically wrong. It is also true that children do not learn languages just from the mother. If symbols are present, uh, then they too form a source of input for the child. Symbols do not correct others and simplify their language for the younger ones among them. Fourth, the logical problem of acquisition. The logical problem of acquisition is that it would seem impossible to learn anything about a certain language without first of all knowing something about language in general. That is, a child must know what to expect in language before he or she can actually order the data he or she is presented with uh, in he or she surrounding and ascribe meaning to words uh, in characters. The evidence of deaf children, the evidence of pigeons. How is language transmitted? Language is obviously passed on from parents to their children. But on closer inspection, one notices that it is a performance of the previous generation which is used as a basis for the next competence of the next. To put it simply, children do not leave access to the competence of their parents. Linguist, first, linguistic input from parents' performance, abstraction of st uh, structures by children, internationalization components of next generation. The above models is the only one which can account for many uh, children can later produce sentences which they have never heard before. The child stores the sentence structures of his or her native language and has a lexicon of words as well. When producing new sentences, he or she takes a structure and fills it uh, with words. This process allows uh, the child to produce a theoretically unlimited number of sentences in his or her later life. Stages of language acquisition. One uh, of the firmest pieces of evidence that language acquisition is genetically predetermined is the clear sequence of stages which children pass through in the first five years of their life. Furthermore, there are characteristics of each stage which always uh, hold. For instance, up to the two words, stage only noun or verbs occur, no child begins by using conjunctions or prepositions, although he or she will have heard these words classes in his or her environment. Another characteristic of over extension, children always begin acquiring semantics by over extending meanings, for instance, by using the word dog for animals if the first animal they are confronted with a dog, or by calling all males papa, or by using spoon for all items of, of cutlery. 
The generalization here is that children move from one, the general uh, to the particular to begin with their language is undifferentiated of all, on all linguistic levels with the with time, they introduce more and more distinctions as they are repeatedly confronted with this from their surroundings. Increasing distinctions in language may well be linked to increasing cognitive development. The more discriminating the child's perception and understanding of the world, the more he or she will strive to reflect this uh, in language. So the first stage is organic sounds, crying, cooing. The second is beginning of the babbling phase. The, uh, the Next one, the first comprehensible words. Uh, uh, the next one is inflection occurs, negation, interrogation, and uh, imperative sentences. And the last one is a vocabulary of about a thousand words, after which will be uh, the main syntactic rules have been acquired. These divisions of, of the early period of first language acquisition are approximate and vary from individual to individual. That's all. Thank you. So that's the end of the presentation of the discipline Introduction to Linguistics. Thank you for your attention.